Oh, where to begin? Well, I'll start when I first saw the ad on Craigslist. It stated that the person was looking for a responsible and hardworking person to edit wedding films in the Philadelphia area. I'd been in a film since I was five, and at the time, I was working as a cashier at a local grocery store, so I felt this was my chance to finally get a prestigious job as a filmmaker. I responded to the ad and got a response in a few days. He told me his business. I looked up his films and they were genius. I have never seen such high quality wedding films. They really told a story and I was intrigued. A few days later, we planned an interview. It was a dreary day when I went to his worn down apartment in a city that was local, but not in the best part of town. As I walked out of my car, he greeted me at the door. He seemed nice, but I felt a little off. I'm very good at sensing people's emotions and for some reason, I couldn't sense normalcy in the way that he acted. It was strange. He did everything that was considered professional outside, and then we walked up to his apartment and office. He was 23 at the time, a self-made entrepreneur, a wedding film business. I remember one of the first things that he said to me, if you work for me, I won't teach you just about video. I'm going to teach you about life. Being the naive 21 year old I was, I thought this guy was just a really good businessman. Sure, he sounded full of himself, but what boss isn't? I got the job and was ecstatic. I felt on top of the world working for one of the best videographers in the Philadelphia area. I came into work the next day and ended up working on one of those TV dinner tables with a computer on it and a rickety chair. I didn't care. I was doing what I loved and it was awesome. A few months go by and I started noticing his weird behavior. I remember a specific time when his sister came over to visit him and I met her for the first time. She wanted to get to know me so she kept asking me questions about my life and trying to make jokes with me, but he wasn't having it. This was the first time that I sensed that something was seriously wrong with my boss. As his sister would try to engage me in conversation, he would tell me to shut up and do my work. Apparently, a five-minute conversation was too much time to be wasted. I quickly learned the editing program as I've edited extensively in the past. I eventually was editing one to two films a week, and despite my boss being sort of strange, I thought it was still the job for me. This was when the craziness had started. I started to learn the DSLR cameras. I began learning his basics of editing skills in his films. I'm very talented in video editing, but sometimes it takes weeks or even months to learn how a particular company goes about their editing. The first thing I noticed is that he had clinical depression. He would look to me to support him and make him happy again. I thought I was being a good friend or employee by offering sympathy because of the fact that I've been suffering from depression since I was 12. Eventually, the therapy sessions became a little uncomfortable. He would put his arm around me, despite the fact that I had been with my boyfriend for three years. One time, he got me so high on marijuana that I couldn't stand on my own two feet. To me, it didn't matter. My boyfriend smoked weed and this was a great time to finally get into something that he enjoyed too. As the months went on, I started to notice things that I didn't before. He was working behind a huge mahogany desk with a large screen, while I was working on a TV dinner table on a small laptop editing most of his films. So then came the shooting part. I began to learn the basics of shooting a wedding, getting the right shots and the right lighting. It was then that I started to realize this man was unstable and possibly aggressive. There were nights when we would do a same day edit. These were three minute videos that the company would create for the couple and show at the end of the evening. It was a stressful environment. He was usually the one editing these same day edits in the beginning, but the pressure was terribly strong. I would film with people that he knew for years that had their own video companies. I was ignored, I was the outcast, and I sort of followed them around. 
I felt useless, but I held on knowing that eventually I would learn the trade. As the months passed, I was his main editor. I edited all the films, chose all the music, and sometimes would leave my own shoots when he had another shoot somewhere else. I found myself to be extremely talented. I knew how to make a film beautiful, and how to make a story of love meaningful. I noticed that he loved to criticize me over time. If it wasn't the audio, it was the video. If it wasn't the video, it was the lighting. If it wasn't the lighting, it was the photography. If it wasn't that, it was me. I began to beat myself up. How could I not be good enough when I was trying my absolute hardest? Was I a failure? Should I even be in this field? There were a few more same day edits that my boss would do the edit on. It was extremely stressful because I had to make sure we had all the awesome shots we needed in order to make a fantastic film. Eventually, I edited my own same day edit. I cried because of their reaction. I feel I'm a pretty sympathetic person so I saw their happiness and felt whole when I saw that. Despite the pressure, I continued on with my job but as I continued, I noticed more aggressive behavior on his behalf. He would start hitting on me, flirting endlessly and giving me back rubs. Do you know how creepy it is to get a back rub from your boss inside of his own house? It was a small business so that's where we worked, out of his own home. It started becoming more of a hangout session rather than work. He would tell me about his low self-esteem and would somehow work his way into putting his arm around me. I felt extremely uncomfortable during these times but I was naive and I had no idea how to approach the situation. He eventually he became an angry person. He would scream at me in the car or belittle me at a shoot. I felt like I was nothing and that I was an idiot. I felt that I would never become the amazing filmmaker that this man had become. He constantly belittled my edits. He would say, The film is boring and you need to redo it. But all the while he was on his computer surfing the internet while I edited these films to perfection. Over time, I realized I was doing everything besides booking the gigs. I was editing the film, I was burning the DVDs, I was posting blogs and I was shooting weddings, and I was dealing with this man. The man that made me feel like I was small. Eventually, I started standing up to him. He didn't like that. How dare someone challenge his ideals? I noticed when I did question his ideas that he would become aggressive. He acted as if because he was two years older than me and owned his own business that I was a schmuck and without him I would be nothing. The flirting and belittling continued. I was told that I was not meant to be with my boyfriend. He started becoming more physical, trying to connect with me by introducing me to sci-fi shows. I enjoyed them and I believe this was his way of having a hobby between him and I that I did not have between my boyfriend and I. And so, the physical contact went on and on, and I, a naive kid, thought he just didn't realize social norms. He was socially screwed up and had to read books about how to be a good person and how to persuade people to do things. I thought he didn't realize that touching your employee over and over again wasn't the right way to go about things. No, I was wrong. He knew exactly what he was doing. Over time, he continued to touch me. He would massage my shoulders and he would insist on a huge, much longer than a normal hug. He was in the pickup artist industry and after a while, I felt like his prey. Eventually, I started standing up for myself and becoming equally aggressive towards him. I began telling him that I was uncomfortable with his touching. I called him out on his BS. I told him his yelling at shoots was irresponsible and cruel. I mentioned that his personality was narcissistic because he wanted to know what I thought he was. I told him that he was socially messed up and that it was pathetic, that he had to read a book to understand how to be nicer to another human. He eventually accepted what he was, I think, because at this point things started getting worse. There is an instance when I couldn't find the car where he parked to retrieve his cell phone. He was waiting at the front desk at his venue to figure out which room the bride was in. It was about a 15 minute walk to the garage and when I got there, 
I started panicking because I couldn't remember which floor we had parked on. We eventually ran into each other and he immediately started screaming at me in the elevator, with two people in there as witnesses. It's floor 5, how could you not know that? We park there every time. My boss yelled at me so loud that the two men in the elevator were noticeably scared. When they left, I told him that I was quitting once and for all. I couldn't stand this anymore, the yelling, the belittling, the nonsense. I was done. Two weeks later, I was working on an edit on a laptop at his house. It would be about a month until I was out of there. I know I was being very generous with my time, but I was trying to do the right thing. I remember distinctly him talking to me, joking around, and then grabbing a pocket knife on his table which had been fully extracted. He held it to my neck. He tried to play it off as if he were joking, but I knew that he wasn't. I joked with him so he would release the knife. For the rest of the night, I was incredibly scared, but I wasn't about to tell him. Remember, this is a sociopath. He gets off on fear and he gets off on power. Finally, the knife was away from my throat and for the rest of the night, I played the loyal employee. This is when I finally said, This is it. I was scared for my life. When is it ever okay to put a knife to a person's throat, no matter how well you know them? It scared the crap out of me and in a week I told him that I was leaving his company. He was enraged. He pounded on his steering wheel as I told him this in the car. This reminded me of the time we went to NYC to shoot a huge wedding, and on the way home he freaked out because he kept taking the wrong exit. He pounded the steering wheel that night, was driving erratically and was verbally abusing me apparently for not reading Google Maps correctly. I don't own an iPhone and never have. I don't know how to use them very well so I guess I was the idiot. Not the guy who I was in the car with who kept taking the wrong exits. I was stuck in a car with a madman. I just couldn't take it anymore. The knife, the yelling, the touching, everything. I eventually left this job and got a job with a mutual business friend. I can't explain to you the fear I felt with that knife to my neck. At that moment I realized that I was definitely working with a psychopath and that I would be killed if I did not leave that situation immediately. To this day, I haven't talked to him in about two years. He ruined a huge part of who I am. I used to trust people and I used to believe in those who had a dream. But this man, this man, I, I could go on for hours about all the terrible things he has done. I barely even cover the evil things this man has done to me. Some backstory. My parents split when I was about 14. It wasn't a good breakup and my dad was an abusive drug addict. So when my mom left him, she was in a really bad place. Her and my older sister kept taking her to local bars since my mom was depressed. This led to my mom becoming an alcoholic since my sister was well on her way to becoming one too. During one of these nights, she met a guy. I didn't know much about him, just that they met him and his brother at a bar and now she was dating him. It went pretty fast and my sister would flirt with the brother to get free food and drinks from him. Around this time, I was about 15 and this dude just seemed off. He was probably early 40s or so and he was always going on my mom's dates with his brother. He just kind of hung around a lot. One day, my sister decided she wanted sushi and called the brother up to take us because she knew that he would pay. I didn't want to go but we didn't have food in the house and I was hungry. We didn't have a sushi place in our town so we had to drive to the city which was about 30 minutes away. The entire ride I just had this warning feeling in my stomach that kept telling me to get out of the car, that this was a bad idea. I was a giant ball of anxiety the whole 30 minutes. My sister sat in the front seat completely oblivious to what was happening. Meanwhile, I kept catching him staring at me in the rearview mirror. Once we got to the restaurant, he sat himself directly across from me. He wanted to sit next to me, but I rushed to sit next to my sister instead. It was awkward, but my sister talked a lot, so I was kind of able to hide. Eventually, she got up to go to the bathroom, and then I was all alone with him. Almost immediately, he asked me if I had a boyfriend, and I said no. That's good, he said. You're too good for the high school boys. 
They're only after one thing. I just nodded, not knowing what to say. He then went on to ask if I liked Disneyland and I said yes. He got excited and went on about how he would take me but hotels were expensive. So we would probably have to share a room. It would just be us so my mom and his brother could be alone. He said my sister couldn't come though because he couldn't afford to pay for us all to go. At this point, I was extremely uncomfortable and I just wanted my sister to come back. She finally did and he switched to just talking to her. She didn't notice anything was wrong or that he kept looking at me. Once we had finished, he took us home and invited himself in. I went to my room and I locked the door and hid. At one point, someone tried to open my door but they stopped once they felt that it was locked. My mom and her boyfriend came home around then. I tried talking to my sister but she brushed me off. They had invited us back to their house and I wanted so badly to stay home, but they forced me to go too. Almost immediately, my mom and her boyfriend went to the room and left my sister and I with them. He got my sister drunk pretty fast and tried to get me to drink but I kept refusing. It got to the point where my sister was almost blacked out drunk and I was freaking out because once she passed out, it would just be us. I started texting my brothers hoping that one of them would be able to pick me up. Thank God my oldest brother responded. I told him what was happening and he came to get me. He showed up and told the guy that it was late and that I had school so he was taking me home. He tried to protest but my brother was very firm about it. He loaded my sister in the car, texted my mom that he was taking us home and then we left. My brother didn't live with us since he was about 30 at the time and had his own family, so he didn't know what was going on. I told him the full story and he got really quiet and then waited until my mom got home. He told her off, shamed her for putting me in that situation and told her that if it continued, he would move me into his house. My mom broke down then and told him that she wanted to break up with her boyfriend because of his brother. I found out when I was older that he would sneak by the door to listen to them when they had sex. I think more happened but my mom never talked about it more than that. She broke up with him, got a good job and sobered up with the help of my brother. It took my sister a lot longer but she eventually got her life back together. Okay, to preface this, here's a little backstory. At the time of this incident, I was 17 years old and a senior in high school. I rode the school bus sometimes when my friend didn't drive me home. This is what happened that day. I got off my school bus on my street and the stop was at an intersection between my street and the highway. My street isn't a big street, it only has about 7 houses. And every person on my street is a business owner. I know all my neighbors. Well, I got off my bus and while I'm walking towards my street, a white van pulls up and stops in front of the bus. The van had tinted windows and those sometimes illegal tints on the front window as well. Well, I walked onto my street and the bus drove away. And once the bus went away, the van turned onto my street. It drove slow and kept with me. I immediately was just like, oh, absolutely not. Because kidnapping is a big thing in my state. I saw the car stop right next to me and that's when I ran. I ran across one of my neighbor's lawns as I heard the man in the van open his door. I went on the phone and turned on Noonlight, an app where if I let go of the button on the screen, it immediately sent police to my location. I ran as fast as I could and hid for 10 minutes, waiting for the van to drive away. Once the van left, I went to my house and told my parents and we called the police. The police came, interviewed me, and told me that there had been sightings of that car all around town. And there were even a few disappearances linked to it. It's been about a year and nothing has happened. And I'm beyond happy about that fact. I'm a 30-year-old woman living in Texas and I've met my fair share of creeps. But what happened to me yesterday takes the cake. 
I don't drive and I work in another city so I have to commute to and from work, using mostly the bus and the same stops on a daily basis. I just started using public transportation last year, so I'm mostly pretty comfortable with it by now, which makes yesterday's experience all the more unnerving. I have gone to the store after work for some soda so I had a reusable bag with 2 liters in one hand and my purse in the other. Approaching the bus stop, I saw a woman sitting inside. It's one of these shelter types, and while I'm normally very shy and won't sit down if someone is in there, I considered it because I was feeling fairly sick and my feet hurt after being on them all day. That idea quickly disappeared when I got closer and could hear her muttering to herself. I did a quick glance over as I walked past and could see that she had her bag spread out over that side of the bench and her shoes were off. So I concluded that she was probably homeless and since her muttering to herself it definitely put me on edge. I walked past the stop to maybe two yards away or so and set the reusable bag down. Uncomfortable, I pull out my phone and begin to text my best friend to tell her, and this is about when I start noticing what she's saying. Things like, Don't call me sweetie. I'll freaking kill you. Okay, hackles raised even more and I'm so curious to take a peek over, and I figure it's probably best not to risk antagonizing her at all, so I don't want to turn her attention to me. I keep messaging with my friend and the lady is muttering the entire time. Things like, don't call me sweetie, don't call me honey, don't call me anything. She's also saying things that I can't quite catch, but what I did was, I'll wrap my hands around your throat and kill you. At this point, I'm thinking maybe I should just nope it out of there, but the bus is set to arrive any minute and even though the station is just down the street, I'm reluctant to try for it because I really just want to get home. It's stupid, I know. But she hadn't done anything to make me think that she'd even noticed that I had existed yet. Around this time, I hear her begin saying things about a fat ass. Now, this certainly alarms me as I'm not a slim woman and an ass is a fairly gender specific word. But what sends shivers down my spine is when I hear, Your phone doesn't scare me. Clearly, she's speaking about to me now, as I've had my phone out since I got here. Just as I'm about to grab my bag, I look to the side, and she's now outside of the shelter staring at me with a look of intense hatred. There's still maybe one or one and a half yards between us, but it's not enough to make me risk leaning over to pick up that bag and possibly give her an opening. She starts again with how I've got to stop calling her sweetie, but now I can hear the other stuff that I was missing before. Things about how she wasn't going to screw me, she wasn't going to worship me. I wasn't going to cost her her morals or her relationship with God and just all kinds of crazy stuff. I'm looking anywhere at this woman, completely terrified as she keeps talking about attacking me and putting her hands around my neck. She sits back down and I completely, idiotically, am frozen to the spot. And I feel like I don't even dare lean over even now that she's a safe distance away. Also, this is taking place next to a very busy road that directly connects to a highway, so I think it gave me a false sense of security. She keeps muttering. I slowly come to the conclusion that my bus isn't coming and I'm now in tears, and then she gets up again. She's much more venomous now and I'm completely terrified, the most scared I've been in my life. I see a man crossing the street and as he steps onto the sidewalk, I take a deep breath and hope for the best, I lean over and grab my bag and nope the heck out of there, watching over my shoulder the entire way. I walk down to the next bus stop and immediately call the police to connect me to the right department and I tell them what happened although my physical description isn't very good since as I told them. I hardly even glanced at her because I was really worried about antagonizing her. Not long after that, a family member happened by and gave me a ride so I didn't have to bother with the bus at all. Also, my brother lives in an apartment complex just down the road from that stop, 
and he told me that she had been sleeping there for about a week, and he had had a minor encounter with her last night, so I guess they didn't find her. But she was gone this morning and still gone this afternoon, so maybe somebody else complained. I hope so because not only do I fear for the safety of people who come into contact with her, I did legitimately fear for my safety throughout the encounter, but I feel really sorry for her and I hope she can get the help that she needs as well. Back when I was attending university, I used to work on campus at one of the dining halls during the dinner or night shift. I lived in the next town over since it was cheaper to live in a crappy little apartment out of town than to live on campus in the dorms. But I didn't own a car so I had to take the bus to commute. One night, I had just gotten off a shift at work. My feet were killing me and I was completely exhausted, and I slowly made my way to the bus stop. I noticed a man much older than me sitting on one of the two benches at the otherwise empty bus stop, but I didn't pay too much attention to him. I simply sat down on the second bench and listened to some music while waiting for the bus to arrive. And the first sign that things were starting to get weird was when I kept noticing out of the corner of my eye that he was staring at me. At first, I thought I might be imagining it, so I looked over and caught him quickly turning his head to look away. Okay, so he was staring at me. This wasn't completely out of the ordinary since being a young college girl seemed to gain me a bit of attention from older men. So like usual, I just ignored him. That was a mistake. Again, out of the corner of my eye, I saw him look at me, but instead of just staring at me this time, he got up and walked over to sit next to me instead. I continued listening to my music, hoping that he would see my headphones in and take the hint that I wasn't interested in talking, but instead, the man literally took them out of my ear. Hey there, sweetheart, he said as my head snapped to look at him in shock. I should have told him off for touching my things and demanded that he leave me alone, but I was sort of frozen, and I didn't want to make him mad. Um, hi, I replied quietly. He started introducing himself as Mike and telling me that he lived in the area, and that it was always nice to see pretty girls like me at the university bus stop. He explained that he was a real man, unlike the boys that I went to school with, and that I should go home with him that night. I was a shy, scared girl who had never had a man be as bold as this to my face. I say to my face because I had certainly got my fair share of unsolicited private pictures online by that point, but I digress. I didn't know how to respond, so I didn't. But that didn't stop Mike from continuing to explain to me all of the fun things he wanted to do with me at his place that night. At that point, I wished that I was anywhere else but that bus stop. But it was just the two of us in the dark alone, as I counted these seconds until the bus would arrive. And then Mike took things to a different level of shocking by telling me, Listen, the demons want me to ask for your phone number, and they say that you should give it to me or you won't like what happens. He actually had the audacity to start stroking my hair. His hand was gentle, but I didn't want him touching me at all. And this was shocking for a number of reasons. The demons, I wouldn't like what would happen. Why was he touching me? What the heck was this guy talking about? As though he could read my mind, Mike went on to explain. My therapist knows the demons are real. I told her about them and she says that I'm not crazy and that the demons are real. He laughed and then abruptly stopped. Now give me your phone number like they said. He demanded. As his hand stroked my hair for the last time, he stopped and gripped the back of my neck, still gentle but even more terrifying. I was scared, and obviously didn't want him to have my phone number, but he was taking out his phone and I knew that he was going to call the number I gave him to make sure that I wasn't lying to him, and he still had his hand on the back of my neck, so I reluctantly gave him my real phone number. It's stupid, I know. But I was right, and he immediately called a check. All I could think about was just not making this guy angry long enough to get away from him, and then I would block his number. Thankfully, the bus came moments later, 
I sat down as close to the front of the bus near the bus driver as I possibly could, since the bus was basically empty. Mike decided to sit directly across from me. At this point, I tried listening to music again, hoping that being on the bus and him having my phone number would signal to him to end our conversation. However, he decided to reach over and unzip my sweatshirt, revealing my work shirt and the name tag which I had unfortunately forgotten to remove in my haste to leave work that night. I hadn't told him my name yet. Abigail, what a beautiful name. Our daughter will be named Celeste. I shouldn't have been shocked at this point, but I was. I had stopped listening to music again and zipped my sweatshirt back up, which made him laugh. You won't need that soon anyway, he said and he winked at me, implying how he had planned to do what he wanted to do further that night. At one stop, Mike tried to convince me to get off the bus with him. I told him no that I was tired and just wanted to go home, and so he said okay and he stayed on the bus. I knew that that had to be a stop, so the fact that he was staying on the bus worried me. I was sure this meant that he was planning on coming home with me instead. Maybe, Mike whispered to me. I tried to ignore him, but he repeated himself louder. Baby, he had the most unsettling smile on his face as I asked. What? He laughed and told me. The demons say you smell nice. I was terrified and felt like I was going to throw up by the time my bus stop arrived. I lived in an apartment alone and I didn't want to know where I lived. Despite my body being exhausted and sore from work, adrenaline kicked in and I bolted off the bus and ran straight home. I made it inside and locked the door. I looked through the peephole and I didn't see him, so I went carefully to peek out of my window and saw him standing near the bus stop, looking around. He took out his phone and sure enough, I started getting a call from an unknown number since I hadn't saved his number. I ignored it. When he hung up, I started getting several texts, asking where I had gone, how he didn't like hide and seek, and how the demons just wanted to have fun. I was so scared because he knew which apartment building I lived in, where I worked and where I went to school, my phone number and my name. The only good thing which made me feel slightly relieved was that he didn't know which specific apartment number I lived in. And that's when he started yelling outside. There were no specific words said, just wordless yells of what I could only assume were frustration and anger. I blocked his number and I kept all the lights in my apartment off as I cried with my back to the front door. Maybe I should have called the police, but my brain was so frazzled that I didn't even think of that until the next day. And by then, all I knew about him was that he was a mentally unstable man, probably named Mike, who hadn't actually done any physical harm to me, so I didn't think that it was worth it. In hindsight, I know that I made a lot of stupid mistakes during his experience. I ended up moving away entirely at the end of that term of school for unrelated reasons, but until then, I switched to day shifts at work and was paranoid every night. Thankfully, I never saw the man again, though. I'm not used to being alone, first things first. I have anxiety and struggle going places alone without friends or family. I live in Australia, so school started a few weeks ago. The way to school is one of the only things I can do by myself without freaking out. It's the same bus route every time with the same students that got on every time. I lived about an hour away from school, so I had to leave pretty early. It was 7.34 a.m. and the bus arrived. I sat in the back next to a girl with hair similar to mine, shoulder length and light dirt brown. We talked for about 20 minutes before she got off to go to her school, a different one from mine. I put my headphones in and listened to my music, had it blaring to distract myself from my growing anxiety. Twelve minutes in, a man with greasy long brown hair sat across from me. He had a briefcase and was wearing a suit that hardly fit him. He looked professional yet messy. I paid no mind and continued listening to my music and scrolling through Reddit posts, Animal Crossing, Overwatch, and subreddits like that. 
Once that take me into another world or a game away from reality. A bad idea in this situation. One song ended and I snapped back to reality for a few seconds. I looked up so that I didn't miss my spot. Still about 45 minutes away. The man had moved spots and was now sitting two spots away from me. On the same row of the seats. I paid no attention. These seats were comfier. Heavy breathing could be heard from him. As I felt his glance on me and my school dress. A lump of my throat grew. Maybe an overreaction, but I'm terrified of being harassed or more. Hey. He said after roughly five minutes of staring. My eyes slowly moved to him as he glared at me flicking between my face and my dress. Now, I'm 15 and in ninth grade, but I don't know if I look my age. I definitely don't look younger than 14. Now looking at me with my mask pulled up more, he asked what school I was going to. I told him it wasn't any of his business and I asked him to leave me alone. He didn't like this. He asked how old I was and I said 18. I don't know why, I just didn't want to tell my real age. He moved closer, slowly reaching for my bag that has my school logo on it. I grabbed it and pretended to use it as a pillow. He scoffed and picked up his briefcase thinking that I wasn't watching. I had glasses so the screen on my phone hid them a tiny bit. He opened it and took out something small and silver. Now guns are illegal in Australia so my mind switched to a knife. And my suspicions were slowly confirmed. Have you ever been hurt physically? He asked. I nodded, I mean, who hasn't? Especially in Australia. Bad? He asked. No, at least uh, I can't remember. He laughed, forming a pit of fear and sadness in my stomach. I peered up and outside of the bus, still 20 minutes away. Students sat at the bottom of the bus. I didn't recognize anyone, but they could still serve as a way to away from being alone with this freaking creep. Yet I was too scared to move. I peered over at him and he was still staring. The small silver knife glistening in his suit pocket. You're pretty. Screw off, I thought. You can't even see half my face. I felt his eyes on my chest. My chest was definitely developed for my age. I had a fast metabolism so I was skinny and had hardly any strength. Not unusual for a girl who spends most of her free time writing and gaming. Or sleeping. You could tell from my arms. Not ridiculously skinny but not the opposite either. He was talking about random stuff but I couldn't hear him over the sound of my heart beating in my ears. I took a deep breath and slowly came back to reality. It's a shame you have school. I live new here. Of course you do. I'm not a bad guy either. A stupid thing to say. He glared at me angrily like he could hear my thoughts. Emily, I heard. My best friend Lily stood on these steps to the back of the bus. I could see a smile of worry on her face as she placed her water bottle back in her bag. She was little, but she didn't take any crap and she always had my back. She gestured to come sit down with her and some familiar students. I grabbed my bag, covering the school logo with my hand. Once we sat down, I saw the creep staring still. He stared at me the whole ride until we got off at a stop before school so he couldn't find out. The bus was pretty full at this point so he struggled to follow me. Once the bus left, I collapsed on the bench and cried on Lily's shoulder, relieved. I told her everything on the way to school. I knew that he was going to try to hurt me, possibly kill me, and I'm so grateful for my best friend's great timing. This happened a few years ago and sometimes I still have nightmares where I didn't manage to get away. Let me start off by saying that I live in a pretty big city. Lots of bars and clubs and I have experience with partying. I have been in blackout drunk situations and this was not that. 
I no longer go out on my own. That night, I decided to go out to my friends at bar hopping. I mainly knew only one of the girls that I hung out with on the regular. The other two were more acquaintances or strangers. I was very outgoing and I loved many people, so that was a nothing new for me. We had a few drinks at a bar and continued on to the next one, having fun and great times. One of the girls I didn't know well pulled out the party stuff sometime during our second bar visit. I decided to skip it because I wasn't looking to get too effed up that night. My friend said yes and she and the third girl went to the bathroom. The second girl, let's call her Barb, kept saying that I should go with the two others, but I declined and declined. She got a little aggressive and I mean after the third time I declined. My friend came back just then and Barb acted like nothing had just happened. We had some new guys join our group to flirt. I'm in a relationship, but my friend and Barb were not. By then, the second girl had left already. Barb and my friend were starting to get pretty messed up. I went to use the bathroom and to text my boyfriend that I was coming home soon, but I saw that my phone was dead. When I came back, the guys had bought us all shots. I was still pretty sober, so I declined the shot. Barb shoved the shot into my hand and to avoid a scene, I took it. I started to tell my friend that I was heading home but one look at her face and Barb and I saw that they were out of it. I was starting to feel pretty woozy myself. So I grabbed my things and their things and started shoving them to go. The guys that bought the shots were protesting but I wasn't getting resistance from the girls. I held a cab. My phone was dead so no Uber. And I remember putting the girls in the back and telling the driver that we were dropping all my friends at their houses and then going to my address. And then blacked out. I remember dropping off my friend. And then a blackout. And then I was alone with that driver. I was in the front seat and he was holding my hand. I looked around disoriented. Took in the sight of him holding my hand while driving. Like my boyfriend would, I saw my wallet in the center cup holder. The meter was off and was telling me that he was taking me to a romantic place. I told him no, please take me home. That my boyfriend was waiting at home. He said something along the lines of, Stop talking about him, I told you. Which to me in high that indicates that I had told him already many times. He said he just wanted to pretend for a little and he held my hand tighter. I didn't want to trigger a violent reaction, so I left my hand there and started to reach for my wallet with my other hand. He saw, let go of my hand and took my wallet from the cup holder to his other side where I couldn't reach. I was still woozy and I blanted again. When I came to my senses, we were parked near a very known romantic and touristy location in my city. Normally this place is packed, but not that night. It's pretty far from anything else too, and it's surrounded by woods. I started to cry and tell him to please take me home, that I wanted to see my boyfriend. I won't tell anyone, please. He looked at me and said, I will take you home if you pretend you're my girlfriend for a little while. I sat there in shock. I wished my brain wasn't addled. I wished that I had never gone out. I wished that I could see my boyfriend for the thousandth time that night. I said okay and he smiled, put my wallet back in the cup holder. I took it slowly and put it under my leg. He took my hand and looked out the front window out into the little lake that he had brought me to. He started talking and I don't remember what he was saying. I was trying not to black out again. I waited for him to look at me and asked again, please take me home. He said if I let him give me a kiss, but I said no. He looked mad for a fraction of a second and squeezed the hand he was still holding. He leaned in fast and kissed me anyways. I kept my lips sealed tight against him, ready to fight, ready to bite and scratch and to not go down easy. He let go of my hand and backed away. He started the car and started our way back to civilization. I was crying as quietly as possible, trying not to be heard so he would forget I was there and want to touch me, to hold my hand. I waited until we were near enough people that I could bolt out of the car and find another way home. 
I think he saw me grabbing my wallet from under my leg and knew my intention to jump out at the next red light. But he snatched it again and said that he would drive me. I just nodded, but by then, I didn't care about the wallet, my phone, or anything else. I led jumping out. No matter what, I was going to get home. I didn't know what time it was by then, but I do know there was almost no cars driving in my usually busy city. No buses, no people, I didn't care anymore. He stopped at red light, I unlocked the door and I yanked it open and ran. I didn't look back, but I heard a car appeal out of the intersection. He was running too. My phone was still dead, and no wallet, so no money, and I was really far from my house. I was still drowsy and crying. I had no idea of the time, and I started walking home. I heard a car pull up near me and started running out of instinct. I heard a woman's voice yell out, Are you okay? I stopped and swirled around, and the most beautiful person I have ever seen in this world was walking towards me slowly hands out in front of her so as not to scare me. I started crying even harder, even more incoherent than I had ever been in my life. She hugged me so hard and asked for my boyfriend's number. She called him and he answered straight away. She started telling him where I was and that I was okay, and that she was taking me home. I cried the whole way back, trying to explain what happened but still woozy, still freaking out. It was hard so we drove in relative silence. When we got home, my boyfriend was waiting outside, losing his mind. My savior gave me a phone number to call her when I felt better and drove off. It was 5 a.m. I left the bar at 10 p.m. and that's all I can remember. A week later, my wallet showed up in my mailbox. When I was 16, some friends and I went to an outdoor concert festival type thing. We parked at the mall and took a shuttle to the venue. For perspective, the mall is a 20 minute drive from our homes and the venue is another 20 minutes away in a different direction. During the concert, I ended up losing my friends and the crowd. I didn't care much as I wanted to get to the front, and I could just call them after the concert had ended. Well, of course, I lose my phone somewhere in these sea of people, and don't even notice until the last show wraps up. I search the ground as the people dissipate with no luck. Reluctantly, I just hop on the bus heading back to the mall, hoping to meet them at the car. The car is gone and I start to freak out a little bit. It's 10pm when I head to the bus station to see when the next bus to my city is coming. Just my luck, it happens to be Memorial Day, so no bus is until 10am. I borrow a stranger's phone and call the two numbers that I know. My mom and brother. My mom doesn't answer, but my brother does. He basically gives me the sex to suck talk and hangs up. So I'm alone, scared, and a little drunk in a city that I don't know. I try walking, but quickly give up when I realize that I'm basically walking down a random highway toward who knows where. Back at the station, I'm just staring at the map when a stranger creeps up behind me. He asks me where I'm headed, and I tell him the truth. He conveniently is going to the same city and asks if I would like to split a cab. Realizing this is my only option, as I didn't have enough of my own, we get in the car. It turns out that he had even less than I did. We barely have enough to get to the heart of the city, which is a 10 minute drive from my house, but at least I know my way home from there. During the drive, this guy gets progressively more creepy. He's aware that I'm 16 and he's 25 but he scoots closer every minute to touching me, insisting that I come back with him to his place, and even writes his phone number on my bare leg. As we get there, I realize the situation that I'm in. We are about to get out into this quiet area at 2am, and the cabbie is going to drive off, leaving no one here to hear me scream. The second that he gets out, I turn to the driver and beg him to take me a few streets further, so I can at least put some distance from him and me. The cab driver hadn't said a word the whole way, but he definitely heard everything. He asked me for my address and he drives me all the way home. The creeper watches as the cab drives off, with me still inside. When we got to my home, I offered to wake my mom up to pay him, but he declined, saying that he's just glad that I'm safe. 
I broke in through the kitchen window, got to bed, and cried my tears of relief for who knows how long. This happened to me when I was a kid, uh, 10 to be exact. I grew up in a military family and lived in the Middle East for a significant portion of my life. Because of this, we traveled frequently to different countries because of the low cost and proximity. On this particular vacation, we flew into Cairo, Egypt for a long weekend and we only lived like 2-3 to three hours away. It was late at night and we were staying at the Marriott Hotel which had a taxi shuttle service that was supposed to pick us up. For some reason, our driver never showed, so we were forced to take a regular cab to take us there, which took forever to find that late at night. We finally found one that was offering us a pretty good deal. They don't run by meters instead, they just give a flat rate that they choose, and headed towards the hotel. Out of nowhere, another taxi basically T-bones us in the middle of the road, causing us to stop. There aren't really defined roads in a lot of Arab places, so it isn't really that surprising that we got hit. In Arab nature, the two drivers get out of the cars, each yelling that it was the other's fault, and looking like they were going to throw hands. Eventually, they got back into their respective taxis and parted ways. My family and I were completely taken aback. We had been in Egypt less than two hours and have already had quite the adventure. We finally got to the hotel, exhausted as it must have been at 3am by this point. Our driver helped us get all of our bags out and get settled, and told us that he felt so bad about the car accident, that he offered to pick us up the next morning and take us to the Great Pyramids, which was on our agenda for a super cheap rate. My parents agreed and decided on a time for him to come though, I can't remember when. Flash forward to the next morning. Everyone is ready for the day, excited to see how crazy it was going to be. Our driver was outside waiting for us, leaning against the car like someone in an old movie would, right when he said he would be there. I'm a blonde haired, blue eyed girl that had a deep tan at the time, and being in Egypt, that was a rare sight. When the driver saw me in the daylight, he gave me the creepiest, most unsettling look that sent chills down my spine, even as a ten-year-old. I knew something wasn't right with him. Nonetheless, we got in his taxi and headed towards the pyramids. He continued to try and talk to me and joke around with me the whole ride, something I found to be extremely creepy, and bold since both my parents were in the cab. We get super close and there is an entrance that people can go through and walk the long distance to the pyramids. And there is an entrance that taxis can go through. You have to pay to see them, it's strange but true. Our driver keeps making jokes about my blonde hair and blue eyes and bringing up that he could get me into the pyramids for free, so my parents wouldn't have to pay the extra ticket price. We laughed it off and my parents paid him and said thank you and began to exit the taxi. I don't remember how it happened, but at some point after I got out of the car he did too and he directed me towards his trunk. I was confused and thought that we had forgotten something, so I stayed behind as my parents walked towards the gate to get whatever I thought we had left. The driver pops the trunk, but there wasn't anything in it. He grabbed my arm and put a hand on my back, trying to push me into the trunk and said, I'm getting you in for free, over and over again as I resisted. Naturally, I freaked out and screamed out to my mom and dad at the top of my lungs, terrified. When they heard me and noticed that I wasn't behind them, they started sprinting back to the car. When the driver heard me scream, he immediately let go of me, closed the trunk, and drove away just as my parents started to run to me. I was crying my eyes out, terrified out of my mind knowing that a taxi driver tried to put me in his trunk, and drove away the second that I screamed for help. It's scary to think what could have happened to me had he been stronger and more prepared, or faster, he is the reason that I am still terrified of taxis, Ubers, Lyfts, and any car service of that nature. This happened quite a while ago. My lifestyle at the time was very high risk. This story means a lot to me as it restored my much needed faith in humanity. To explain why this incident meant so much to me, I need to provide a bit of backstory. I live in a really sketchy part of town. 
The particular building I lived in was a refurbished loft type with a very ugly history. You could still see the damage in the concrete walls from all the gunfire that it had taken at one point. Talking the pizza guy into delivering was always fun. No sir, it's not still a crime scene. Yes, real people live here. There was a local gas station within walking distance. Your typical shady place populated by shady people doing shady things. I had and still have a tendency to be somewhat chatty and polite when spoken to by strangers. Especially if I frequent that store and see them often. I wound up making friends with a man named Houston, who had a talent for obtaining recreational plant life. We would hang out and philosophize about life and the like. I just felt like he had a good soul. I was coming home from a bar that I frequented one night. It was a Friday and that area was a popular night spot so at closing time cabs would line up. I was quite drunk but sober enough to know better than to drive. The cab driver was talkative and I was not. I just wanted to go home and watch the world spin. Almost immediately out of his mouth came some of the most lecherous and disgusting things I'd ever heard. He would arc his neck around while driving, lick his lips and say just horrible things. And the worst part was not only did he have me in a moving vehicle, but he knew where I lived. I had no phone and just enough money for the ride home and I was terrified. You want me to pull in so I can lick you? No thank you, I'd like to go home and vomit. Being the smartass that I was, I said that. It was as if I hadn't said anything at all to the man though. He kept turning around and reaching out to grab me as I swerved out of his reach. Hey, show me him, I want to see him. The situation escalated when he started to drive around aimlessly, pulling into dark complexes and slowing down to try and grab me. I had to do something, so I did something that I don't think he was expecting. I flirted with him. I leaned over the front seat and gave him my best drunk and seductive face and said, Do you want a party? He stopped, looking blank for a moment before a huge grin widening across his face. Oh yeah, where do you want a party? You want a party here? He started to adjust himself and I wanted to rip that freaking thing off. No, not here. Let's get some beer and go to my place. He agreed and I led him to my local gas station. Pull in here and I'll go get some. What do you like? I said sweetly. He said he didn't care and as soon as he parked I grabbed my bag and got out. He sat there waiting. My voice must have had an obvious tone of panic as I asked the lady behind the bulletproof glass. Is Houston here? She looked concerned and shouted for him. He came out from the back. I was so relieved and in one hysterical breath, I told him everything. The expression on his face darkened and he said to me very curtly, You stay here. I walked to the window as he exited the store. He took three steps outside, whistled, and with arms out on either side, he made a come here motion. Out of the darkness came twenty really scary guys from both sides. He pointed to the cab and said something that I didn't quite make out. Whatever it was, they swarmed the cab and they tried to flip it over. That cab burned rubber peeling out of the parking lot. The men then looked back at the store window in Houston and laughed nodded and they disappeared back into the darkness. It was surreal. My jaw was on the floor and Houston came back inside with a grin. I don't think he'll be back. I couldn't thank him enough. He was my hero at that point hands down. It had started to rain so he and his friend walked me home under a giant umbrella. There are no words to describe the restoration of my faith in humanity that night. Cliché as it sounds, there really is light in the darkest of places and kindness in the most unexpected of places. I'd like to preface this by saying that not all mental health professionals are bad people. Good doctors and medication have saved my life. I also didn't grow up in the US, so if you see something in this story that makes you go, that's not how it works. Keep in mind that other countries might have different laws. And furthermore, this describes my experiences with staying at a mental hospital. So prepare for triggers. Alright, here we go. 
I was a troubled kid. I'm kind of a troubled person in general. But when I was in my early teens, specifically in this story, I was 14. I was doing some bad stuff and refusing to go to school. So I was put on a waiting list for a children's a mental hospital. I know now that the fact that I was on that waiting list for close to half a year should have been the first warning sign. At the time, I enjoyed being on sick leave from school, which basically meant I got to play The Sims until 6 in the morning for 5 months straight. But when I had to pack my stuff to actually go to the hospital, I of course didn't really want to go. I wanted to get help, don't get me wrong, but the idea of being away from home for 6 weeks, which is the standard time they take to analyze and watch you to give you a diagnosis, after which you can choose to pursue treatment, it scared me. I arrived at the hospital in tears, my mom carrying my suitcase for me. The nurses noticed that obviously I didn't want to stay. Are you here on your own free will? The doctor asked me. I shook my head. They just shrugged it off saying they could get a judicial decision forcing me to stay there. I never go to talk to a judge. I never got to defend or explain myself. And as far as I know, my parents didn't talk to a judge either. A judge glossed over my medical history and then signed a piece of paper that forced me to stay in this place for six weeks. The contents of my suitcase were searched and I remember feeling like I had just arrived in prison. The first terrifying thing happened to me on my first night. I had scratched open some of my old scabs and when I went to the nurse to ask for a bandage, everyone went nuts. In their eyes, I had purposely harmed myself, which they couldn't prove but okay. So what do you do when a 14-year-old mental patient does this? You talk to her, you try to help. No, you take away all their jewelry, a necklace from my mom and a bracelet from my ex-girlfriend, who at the time, I still had very strong feelings for her, and send her off to the timeout room for 24 hours. The timeout room was a small room with a big window that could just barely fit a bed. If I'd used the bathroom, I had to ask a nurse to accompany me, and no joke, at one point I was in the bathroom, with a nurse standing guard in front of the door. She asked if I was doing okay, and I sarcastically responded with, no. She goes, really, and she ripped the door open. All of my clothes were taken from my room and kept in the front office for the time I stayed in the timeout room. So whenever I needed them, I had to go up to the front office to ask for them. But apart from having to ask for clothing and the bathroom trips... I was completely left alone in that room. No one ever came to check up on me. Getting out of the timeout room wasn't a lot better. For the first week or two, I had bad stomach problems. I would get up multiple times a night to use the bathroom. Which, by the way, you didn't have one of them in your room. You had to walk down the hall to use it. And because my stomach kept me up all night, I would often not get enough sleep and end up sleeping through the day. Which led to me not partaking in group activities. And instead of, I don't know, waking me up, I was yelled at and I quote, If I was up all night roaming the halls, I would be tired too. And because I didn't partake in group activities, I couldn't earn outside time. Yes, I had to earn going outside. Even just sitting on the front steps with a nurse right next to me had to be earned. So, for the first six weeks, I was effectively locked up. Except for school and weekends where I was allowed to go home. It was blatantly obvious that none of the nurses really cared about any of the patients. They weren't even real nurses. They were more like prison guards. One of them straight up looked like they were homeless. Another one sounded like she had been a five packs a day smoker her life and all. And I mean all, all of them were chain smokers. Every free second they had, they would use it for smoke breaks. Right outside of the door too, with the doors open. So that all the other kids who were currently going through nicotine withdrawals could smell the cigarette smoke. Within six weeks of staying at the mental hospital, I saw a psychiatrist at Whoopin two times, once for a general introduction and once for an IQ test. Anyone who's ever struggled with mental illness probably knows this sentence like, just pull yourself together or get over it. They're the least helpful things one could say to a mentally ill person. I've never heard it that much in my entire life. There was one instance where another patient who was deathly afraid of spiders, came running out of her room in a borderline panic attack because she had woken up to a spider directly in front of her face. And you know what they told her? 
Don't be such a baby, it's just a spider. They gave her a broom for her to get rid of the spider herself, which obviously she couldn't do. My roommate and I ended up helping her out. Both of us were scared as well, mind you. But possibly the most outrageous thing happened on my second to last day. Someone had told the guards that I had tried to smuggle in something. So, they pulled me out of breakfast and searched my room top to bottom. They didn't find anything, but they found one laying on the floor in the hallway, and it was even still in its wrapper. I wasn't the only patient that did this. As a matter of fact, I don't think there was a single patient who didn't do it. The blade could have belonged to anyone, they had no proof that it was mine. But of course, it was deemed that it was mine. And despite me not having any new cuts on my arm, I was thrown into the timeout room for another 24 hours. Literally my last 24 hours. And they paid so little attention to the timeout room that a fellow inmate was able to slip a letter inside the door so I could take on my frustrations. In case any of you were wondering where my parents were in all of this, my mother wanted to get me out of that place as soon as she had heard about the timeout room. But since my parents had joint custody, she needed my father to agree to it. My father deserves a story like this for himself, but to make it short, he hadn't talked to me in over four years, but was somehow convinced that I needed help and refused to get me out of there. My final diagnosis from that place, narcissistic neurosis. I was 14 into this day. I had no idea how they came up with any kind of diagnosis, considering I had seen an actual doctor a total of two times. Additionally, this result was delivered to us, my parents and I, by the head doctor of the hospital, who I had never seen in my life, during a conclusive meeting on my last day. I was offered to stay and start behavioral therapy, but I guess it goes without saying that I politely declined that offer. Every therapist and psychiatrist I have talked to since, and trust me, there's been a few over the last seven years, have disregarded the diagnosis entirely. Some have even laughed at it. I'm currently diagnosed with bipolar disorder, depression, and a panic disorder. And my current psychiatrist has suggested that I might suffer from borderline personality disorder. I guess the moral of the story is to always do research on the hospital you plan on getting yourself admitted to. I'm sure as heck that I hope I never have to see any of those guards, nurses, or doctors ever again. To give a little background, I'm a film student in college right now and me and my buddies are always trying to find new locations to film our movies at. I make horror films so all the places I'm looking for and exploring are abandoned. And tonight, me and my group of friends, there were 10 of us in total, decided to check out this abandoned hospital down the street from our school. They had been there before and said it was a great spot for filming and that I should check it out. So tonight was that night. So when we get there, I have my Nikon DSLR out with a handheld LED light attached to the top of the camera to scout the place when we get inside. I didn't film any of the encounter because I usually only film the inside of these places, but I had my camera and light out to shine the way through. I was leading the way down this narrow path that led to these walls that we had to climb to get on the roof of the place, where we would access one of the rooms to get inside the building. Because I was carrying my camera and bag, I was trying to look for another way up. So I walk a little further down this narrow path and I start noticing a lot of clothes and random shoes in cardboard boxes lying around the area. There was even an empty sleeping bag. And that's when I knew that we probably weren't alone and we were likely going to run into someone if we made the wrong move. And boy did we ever. One of my friends walking behind me down this path notices a door to my right. It's closed and my guess was that it was locked and not worth trying. But he already has his hand on the floor handle and starts tugging. I look over and it barely cracks open but something is holding it from the inside. I shine my LED on the inside and I see a shirt tied to the inside door handle to another part of the room, acting as a lock. But my friend, being the way that he is, tugs again and rips that shirt right off and the door swings open. Inside, there is someone sleeping on like a table or a couch, alongside with a group of terrifying looking people sitting by a light inside that room and they all stop and stare at us. In the short glimpse that I got, my friend yells, Oh crap, get the heck out of here. 
and he slams the door and just bolts past me. I was standing there, a little shaken, almost feeling like I should apologize, but I just follow him instead. My eight other friends are already on the roof at this point, asking what's going on, and we just run for our lives out of the area. I heard the door in the path swing open, but I couldn't look back. From there, me and my friend rendezvous back to a higher part of the area, away from any entrance leading to the hospital. There is a small gap that you could jump across to get to one of the roofs of the building that my other friends were on. About four of them follow us and jump across, ready to get out of there. But the others stay on the roof and watch us, stuck like statues. I look at them confused at what they're staring at, and I begin to hear this metal dragging on the concrete. I turn around and there is a crazy looking man, maybe mid-twenties, dragging a baseball bat with nails all along the end walking towards us as he drags the bat along the concrete, acting just like Negan from The Walking Dead. My heart sinks. At this point, I turn off my light and all that's shining is the moonlight. I keep my hand on my pocket knife, desperately trying to think of anything to do if he starts swinging, but I know there is no way I would come out alive if I tried anything. Plus, I gotta take care of my camera. So he walks closer to us and the first thing he says is, you're going to want to keep that light off. And everyone is silent. I'm practically shaking. He then starts circling around us as he says, You guys are never going to come back here, right? He walks past me and sees the camera and raises his bat saying, And you're going to put the camera away. And I just barely say, Yeah, it's off. He looks over to my friends watching in the roof past the gap and he points to them. And he says, Jump and they stand silent. The guy says again, Jump across right now. Just run and jump. You'll make it. Keep in mind, the gap doesn't look that bad, but the drop is fatal if you don't make the jump. And my four friends are all staring down at the drop, fearing what could happen. One of them says, I don't think that I can make it. And the Negan guy replies, Run and jump, or else you're gonna regret it. So my friend steps back, runs, and barely makes the jump. From there, one by one, the other three make the jump across, all while the Negan guy is standing right behind us with his bat, dragging it along the concrete. Once we all got across, he says to us, You're never going to come back here again, you understand. Then we awkwardly apologized and run away back to our cars in the distance. I get in my car and look back at the area, and he's still standing there, watching us with his bat as we speed off. Realistically, we probably could have taken him as a group if anything bad happened, but who knows who else was back there. Sadly, the hospital is a no-go from here on out, but I'll still be looking around for some sick filming locations. What scared me the most about this guy was how fearless and disturbed the guy looked. He had definitely seen some stuff and had undoubtedly used that bat before on someone else. He looked like a killer. He was a killer and it was his calmness that really got to me. Definitely a lesson learned, but regardless, I'm never going back there. This happened about seven and a half years ago when I was 13. My grandmother was in the hospital with pneumonia. By the time my family got there, there was about 11 to 15 of us. Yeah, it's a lot, but five of the eight children were there with their families. After a little while, they told that we needed to leave so they could give her some shots. At the time, we didn't know there was a waiting room on the floor, so my uncle suggested we go down to the first floor so that we could sit in the ER waiting room. We had to go down on two separate elevators since there were so many of us. Once we got down, there we saw two nurses hiding behind a door. When we asked what's wrong, they said nothing. You can still go in there. We walked in. It was about 2 p.m. on a Sunday. There was no one in there and the lights were off. Yes, in retrospect, we should have just turned around and walked back. But like all people in horror movies, we didn't think anything of it. We met up with the rest of the family. And that's when we noticed two other guys. The first man was sitting with his hands behind his back. The second one was standing behind him holding his wrists together. The man sitting was staring daggers right at me. After about 10 minutes of sitting and staring, 
A third man in a hospital security uniform came up and asked if we saw anything. Visibly confused, we said no and they told us that we needed to leave. We went back up to the fourth floor and found the waiting room. It was right next to the psych ward with a sign that said, Stay clear. There's a high chance of flight race. Now you might be thinking what's so scary about that story. A random guy was staring at a 13-year-old girl. Well, a little while later we found out what had happened. The man sitting with his hands restrained was a junkie looking for a quick fix. He had walked in and was told that he couldn't get any drugs without a medical reason. So he pulled out a knife and stabbed the woman at the reception in the neck. While we were allowed in the room with this man while the hospital was supposedly in lockdown, I have no clue. I also have no clue where the police were during this whole situation. This story does have a kind of happy ending, for the woman at least. About two years ago, this incident was brought up at a family gathering. My cousin said that the woman did survive. She no longer works for the hospital and has a lot of difficulties resulting from her injury, but she was working as a secretary for a school. This literally happened today. I advise you to skip this story if you're too sensible to grow stuff or if you're eating right now. So I'm a man and yesterday was my birthday and I just turned 24 which means I spent the weekend drinking my butt off. Friday at a club, Saturday at a bar, and yesterday at a friend's house. So, you can imagine the mess I was this particular Monday morning. I have to take two buses to get to work and the whole stopping all the time thing that they do can make me sick even in a non-hangover day. I considered going by car to avoid this but then thought, ah, screw it. I've been here before. I could as well save the gas money and suck it up the sickness for the hour that I spend riding the buses. A big mistake. I got on the bus and immediately felt sicker, but again, not my first time, and decided to focus my attention on the other bus riders to get my mind off the bad feeling. Bigger mistake. At first, I didn't notice anything weird about this man, about 50 to 60, but then he suddenly got up and changed seats for no particular reason, and I could tell that he was probably homeless because his clothes were very dirty. Okay, no big deal, nothing wrong with that. But then he starts rubbing his fingers against the bus floor and licking them. He smiled as he did this and I noticed that he had a few to almost no teeth. The scene combined with my hangover made me extremely unwell. I thought it couldn't get worse but he got up again and started picking out every pieces of dirt and garbage around the floor and eating them. He then got to the back of the bus and started maniacally laughing which honestly creeped me out. I then decided to close my eyes to avoid seeing whatever he was doing next but... I had to open my eyes occasionally so I didn't miss my stop. And when I saw the spot before mine, I got up, and so did he. As expected, he didn't smell the best, and I had to fight my urge to vomit with him standing next to me. Now, I avoided looking at him, and when the bus finally stopped and the doors opened, he went to the bus's garbage and did the same thing. Now, I couldn't contain myself any longer, and as I stepped out of the bus, I upchucked. I didn't go full blast toy, so it was just a little bit, and the rest, as you can imagine, I swallowed. I then looked up at him, and he was smiling. As I stepped out of the bus, the man got down on the bus floor and started to do the same thing. He was rubbing his hands again at it and getting all in it, and still smiling. I watched for what must have been the longest second of my life. My stop is located in front of a mall in which I got in running as fast as I could, and proceeded to head straight to the bathroom. I know that man was probably ill in some way, but I do feel sorry for him, and expect that somebody got him the help that he needs after seeing what he did today, but I don't want to ever see anybody even resembling him again in my life. It's like he appeared precisely in the day in which I was less able to deal with this kind of stuff, and the image of him doing what he did on the bus floor is forever stuck in my mind. So my fiancé and I had been on the lookout for a kitten to accompany our three-month-old kitten that we have already. We searched and searched until one day he said to me, Let's look on Craigslist, so I did. We found the perfect one, but the only problem was it was two and a half hours away from where we lived. I inquired about it at around 10.30pm. I know it was late, but almost immediately got a response. 
She sounded very nice over text and asked to see where I lived, so that we would feel settled about the kitten living with us. She also insisted on going to their house. I know, I know, I should have just dropped it then. But at the time, I thought nothing of it. So, I sent them a video, and we set up a time for the next day to meet up. The next day came. I wasn't going to take my fiancé, but he insisted on coming with me, because he wanted to be there just in case, and because Craigslist is known to be sketchy. So, we drove the two and a half hours all the way there. As we were on our way, I was messaging this girl that we would get there on time, and she responded, Great, I'll see you then. When we arrived at the home, me in the driver's seat and my fiancé in the passenger seat with the window down. I texted the girl and got no response. I called and no response. I ended up calling five times and texting in the course of an hour and got nothing back. I went up to the house and knocked on the door. Nothing. There was a car in the driveway but no response from the number or the door. We got there at about 6.30 and waited until almost 8 but there was nothing. A neighbor came out asking what was wrong, and I said that I was here to inquire about a kitten, and she said, A kitten? Yeah, the one that was in the ad on Craigslist. She said, No one has kittens in this home, though. I showed her the ad, and she said, Oh, I do know them. They're very sketchy people, and they don't own any cats. I just helped them move their furniture yesterday. Well, on their ad it says that they have to get rid of their kittens since their new place doesn't allow any pets. That's impossible. I have a dog and so does the next door one over. I immediately found this creepy and assumed the neighbor was also in on something, since it was too creepy and I was feeling anxious. I thanked her and left along with my fiancé. Literally immediately when we pulled out of the street, I got a text from the girl saying, I'm just getting your messages now. Something must be wrong with my phone. Did you still want to see the kitten or no? I didn't answer and we headed back home. What I don't understand is they didn't get any money from me, but they asked me to show up not knowing that I would be with my fiance. I had a bad feeling about it. What did they want from me? Okay, so here goes. In early 2014, I was around 18 and started browsing the world of Craigslist. I responded to an ad on the personal section and started texting this woman. Now being 18 and unfamiliar with how Craigslist worked, I didn't see any issue with meeting up at a hotel. I also didn't see anything wrong with her asking for donations. Again, 18 and stupid. I figured donation meant optional. Again, stupid I know, but just to be clear, she never gave me a price nor did I tell her that I had money for her. So I set up a time to meet her. I left my house to head to my GED class as usual, but walked to the hotel instead. It was pouring rain and it was warm out, so by the time I got there, I was all hot and sweaty. I knocked on the room door and she was in and she answered. Her attire should have alerted me, but let's say it again. 18 and stupid. She invited me in and I asked to use the shower quick. So I got undressed in the bathroom and topped in the shower. She started taking off her top and I told her, that's okay, I won't be long. So she goes and waits in the bed, watching TV. I get out of the shower and wrap a towel around my waist. I came out of the bathroom, wet as a dog, looked at her and asked if she was ready. She sprawled out on the bed and says, Donations are due up front. At this point, all the red flags that should have gone off did as I realized the situation I was in. My face dropped as I faced the TV. I nervously told her that I didn't have any money. And she got up and started yelling at me and threw my clothes and a bag at me. I got dressed and actually apologized for wasting her time. So I leave her room and start heading back to my GED class. Before I was out of the parking lot, a guy in a green punch bug calls me over to him. I tried to ignore him and walk past until he shouts to get my attention. So I walk up to the driver's side of this guy's car and he starts talking to me. Now, this guy looked sketchy and I just figured he was the woman's pimp. So he's talking to me with his left arm up on his door 
and his right arm down at his side, holding a freaking pistol. At this point, I'm almost certain that I'm going to get shot. He says to me, So why would you come here knowing that you don't have any money? I explained as calmly as I could that I wasn't aware of the situation. This guy pulls his arm up a little to show me his gun and he says, I have messages between you and her saying that you had money for her. Now, like I said earlier, I never told this woman that I had any money. So this guy decides to lower his gun and says to me, You're lucky you came to one of my girls. All the girls would have stabbed you with a broken pipe. Now, I see you're pretty young, so I'll let you off with a warning this time. He then motioned me to be on my way. But you bet your butt I kept looking back to make sure I wasn't about to be shot from behind. Obviously, I never met up with anybody from Craigslist ever again. I really love Craigslist. I would estimate that I met maybe 300 people for buying or selling stuff, and for the most part, everyone was nice and harmless. However, I did run into two creeps who made me rethink meeting strangers alone to sell stuff. FYI, I was in my early 20s and a female at the time. First guy, it's 2009 and I'm staying with my parents for the Christmas holidays in a small town in Florida. I'm going through my childhood room and cleaning out the closet and find a giant CD holder full of maybe 100 really crappy CDs, like Nickelback, Aqua, Chumbawamba. It's the 21st century, no one uses CDs anymore. So I figured that I'll try to sell these CDs on Craigslist. I put up a listing. 100 CDs from the late 90s and early to mid 2000s. A mix of pop and rock. All for $35 or best offer. The next day, I get an email from a guy named John around 2pm. He said that he's in town temporarily and that he wants the CDs. He says that he could pick them up after dinner around 8pm. I email him back my address and number and tell him to text or call me when he's on his way. 8pm comes and goes. I figure that I've been stood up, which happens often on Craigslist. No big deal. My dad works for a liquor distribution company and would often do demonstration nights at restaurants and bars, and he would come home at the bar's closing time. This night, he gets home at around 3am. I'm in college and a total night owl. So I'm still up probably eating junk food, surfing the web, and watching some horror movies. I hear a car pull up. Look out the window and I see him sitting in his car eating food. He often stops at Taco Bell on his way home and eats in his car, so mom doesn't know that he's cheating on his diet. Maybe ten minutes later, my dad comes in and shouts my name. Hey, there's someone here to see you. Can you please tell me why a strange man is showing up at her house at 3am? Huh? I go downstairs and my dad says some guy pulled up in the driveway and asked for me by name. I walk outside with my dad, and this guy who was in his maybe mid-thirties gets out of his car. He said that he's the Craigslist guy that wanted to buy the CDs. My dad goes back into the house and I tell the guy it's really, really late for him to be stopping by, especially without texting first. However, since I'm awake, I go and grab the CDs. He then proceeds to drone on and on about why he's buying the CDs. He said that he's engaged to a woman that he loves very much and all he wants to do is make her happy. He said that last week, someone broke into her car and stole all of her CDs. She was really upset and he wanted to make it up for her. He looked on Craigslist and found my listing and was really excited because I had a bunch of the CDs that she used to have. The weird thing is, I didn't list any of the artists or bands because I was lazy, but I didn't think about that at the time. Anyway, he said that he was getting it for her as a Christmas surprise. He said he was staying with his future in-laws somewhere nearby, and that their family barbecue ran really late, which is why he never made it to 8pm. By this point, I've lost interest and say something along the lines of, that's sweet, next time you should probably call or text the Craig's Lister instead of just showing up. I hand in the CDs, he hands me the cash, and I go back inside. Three days later, I start getting messages from an unknown number. Hey, I don't know my way around this town. Care to be a tour guide? 
I could really use a massage. Where can I get a good one in this town? You're Asian, do you do it? Would you take $40 an hour for a one-hour massage? Happy ending. Me finally, who the heck is this? Oh, sorry, I bought the CDs from you the other day. I didn't respond. I show my friends that night and we laugh it off. And then the next day, I get more messages. I still have your address. I'm at the bank near your neighborhood. I got that 40 bucks. Only three minutes away, are you home? Stop ignoring me, I'm almost there. I immediately ran downstairs to tell my dad and mom. It was nighttime, so we shut off all the lights outside and inside my house. My mom, a little brother, and I went in my parents' room in the back of the house. My dad hid behind the curtains of the front bay window with a shovel in his hand. A few minutes later, I heard him run down the front hallway, fling the front door open and run outside. I heard some faint shouting, so we all walked out of the bathroom. By that time, my dad came back in with his shovel, his face red and his hair all disheveled. Apparently, the guy came driving down our street really slowly. My dad had recognized the car and went running outside with the shovel, yelling obscenities at the guy. The guy peeled off and never came back or texted me again. The second guy. I was moving from Florida to DC and was going to load up my car as much as I could with some stuff. However, I lived on the third floor plus a bit of a walk from my assigned parking spot, so I figured that I could use some help. I posted an ad on Craigslist. I said I was looking for someone to help me load some heavy items, like a TV, a desk, etc., into my car. Less than an hour's worth of work and I would pay 45 bucks or whatever. I give the very first responder my number and address and he shows up. He was probably 5'8 and 350. And the sweat and smell coming off this guy in the Florida heat was nauseating. But I didn't care as long as he did the job right. While he was carting away the heavy stuff, I was loading lighter things. Whenever I would go upstairs to grab another load, he would hurry after me so he could walk up the stairs behind me. I had the door propped open so he didn't have to worry about me needing to unlock the door for him or anything. And then he would follow me up the stairs and he would make these weird grunting noises but I assumed it was because he was out of shape. Eventually, everything's loaded properly, save for some sweat smears on my stuff. I pay him and he drives off. I go back in my place to finish loading and cleaning. I go out maybe 45 minutes later to put out another load into my car, and I see his truck in the back parked across the street from mine. He's sitting in the driver's seat looking at me. When he sees me notice him, he looks away. I walk over to his window and knock. He rolls it down and asks if he needs any help or if he was lost. I was really confused as to why he had come back, and I knew that he didn't live near me. He didn't say anything, just rolled his window back up and drove off. Whatever. Of course, five minutes later, my phone starts blowing up. I don't recognize the number, so I don't answer the calls. And then the text messages start rolling in. What are you up to tonight? I can come back over. I get this sinking feeling it's the Craigslist guy again. He had never called me about the job when I gave him my number so I didn't know what his number was. And then I realized he was looking at my dress the whole time when I was walking up the stairs. I immediately felt like a total idiot for wearing a dress that day. He then started dialing my number over and over again. I didn't know how to do the block number thing through Sprint, so I just turned my phone off. Later, I was with my guy friend grabbing a bite to eat and turning my phone back on. And I got another text from the guy saying something that I probably shouldn't say on here. I showed the text to my friend and I told him the story. The Craigslist creep then proceeds to start blowing up my phone again. So my friend answers and tells him to stop trying to contact me. I moved away the next day, so I never had to worry about him randomly showing up in his truck again. Since then, I bought and sold stuff on Craigslist, but I always make sure people meet me at a public address. This happened five years ago today, marking this experience's fifth anniversary. 
At the time, I was a shy, religious, sheltered college kid whose social interactions are very dependent on school-related activities. Today, I'm still pretty shy and barely have any social interaction nowadays, but I digress. Being the religious person that I was then, I had requested that my family and I attend Mass on the last Sunday of the year. Sunday came and Mom was the only one willing to accompany me. We attended the last Mass of the day, which is around 6 or 7 in the evening, because it was too hot in the afternoon, and I cannot be bothered to wake up early for the morning Mass. When we had arrived, the Mass had already started and all the pews were occupied, so we stood by the very back of the church. The Mass itself was pretty average, except for a lady in the back of the church who fainted in the middle of the priest's homily. I didn't feel anything was wrong during the whole Mass. Usually after the Mass, when the priest would be standing before the altar, people would approach him to receive his blessing. I had planned to do that, meaning I had to cross the whole length of the church to get to the priest. As I walked on the aisle, I suddenly felt like I was being followed. In the years after this incident, I felt what being followed by friends trying to catch up on me feels like, and that did not match what felt when I was walking down the aisle. I was hoping that my instincts were wrong, but I was quickly disproved when a man came up to my left side. He was taller than I was, I'm 5'2 and he was around 5'7". I couldn't pinpoint his age, but I can guess he was older than I was, maybe early 20s. I didn't know who this person was and I didn't know what he wanted from me. He then started asking me personal questions like my name, my age, and where I lived. I knew that I was lacking in social skills, but I know following a person around at church at night and flooding them with personal questions isn't a great way to make friends. At this point, I was uncomfortable. I was still far from the priest, but was too polite to just simply ignore him. I replied to his questions, but all were with false or vague information. I gave a fake name, a different age, stuff like that. When I did approach the priest, I tried to get his attention to maybe get the guy to leave me alone. But the priest looked like he didn't even care whose forehead his knuckles were touching at the time. Feeling betrayed, I turned to look at the other people nearby but everyone else had their attention on their own business. I couldn't really blame them for that. My last resort was, of course, my mother. I turned around and speed walked my way to the back of the church. But as I neared the spot mom and I stayed earlier, she wasn't there anymore. I panicked and started looking around frantically. The guy was still following me and now asking me where I go to school. I didn't want to talk to him anymore and I didn't want him near me anymore. In my panic searching for my mother, I caught a glimpse of her form sitting at one of the pews at the back. I darted straight to her and squeezed my words out. With no pause that I was being followed and we needed to book it out of the church, Mom, understandably surprised, looked at me, then at the guy who was still by my side and then back at me. She then stood up, took my hand, and walked out of the church with me. By the time that we got to the car, my heart was racing and I was shaking a little. Being the nice person that I was, I tried to rationalize that maybe the guy really had good intentions. My mom would tell me the guy was probably just awkward or socially inept, but everyone else who I'd shared the story with thought otherwise. For a time, I wouldn't go near that area without my brother, and I pretty much lost my dedication to my faith over time because of this experience. So, to the creepy guy who made me feel unsafe in the house of God, let's not meet. When I was 16, I went to an online charter school. There are quotes around online because it had an actual building you had to go to in a sketchy strip mall. Somehow this place was actually accredited by the state. I started going there because I was 16 and I thought I knew better than my dad at the time who wanted me to stay in public school. In order to get home, I would have to get on a bus. And the buses in my city are really cheap and there are a lot of strange people who get on them. Naturally, I had several instances with people on the public transit, but one sticks out to my mind. 
One day, I was sitting on the bus stop bench when a grown man approached me while also waiting for the bus. He was tall, older, and wore dirty clothes. His teeth were all yellowed, which is the second most distinct thing that sticks out to me now besides his mustache. More than likely, he was homeless. The first thing he said to me after sitting just a little too close was, Hi, what's your name? It was weird and a little awkward, but nothing too bad. Despite this, it was setting off creep alarms in the back of my head, so I gave him a nervous smile and a fake name. There was no way I was going to give this guy my real name. Now, I have always looked much younger than I actually am. Even now at 18, I still get comments from people who believe I'm a freshman in high school. This is due in part to having a round face and still dealing with acne. This is what makes what happened next extra weird. He got closer and told me, You know, you're very pretty. I wasn't used to compliments at the time to a certain extent, I'm still not. However, I knew I didn't want them from this guy. I just continued smiling nervously and scooted away from him on the bus stop bench. I remember his breath being pretty rancid, and him trying to scoot closer to me still. You got a boyfriend? Was the next thing he asked. I'm gay, but I did answer yes just to his question. At the time, I was actually trying to force myself to date a close friend who was a man and liked me, so it wasn't a total lie. Even if it wasn't though, I still would have said yes. But this did not deter him. He tried to touch my hair more than once, rested his hand on my knee and tried to move it to my thigh, and other weird stuff. The next thing that he pressed me for was my number. I didn't actually believe this guy had a phone. But in case he managed to find a payphone in the year 2017, I decided to give him a fake number just in case. I was dreading getting on the bus, where I would have to ride all the way home to an empty apartment for hours with a window that had a broken lock. Even if he didn't plan on doing anything that day, what if he did another time? I didn't want this man knowing where I lived. When the bus finally got there, after what felt like forever, I was terrified but unsurprised to find that he got on the same one. I made a beeline for a seat next to an old woman where he couldn't sit next to me. He sat in a close by seat and kept glancing at me for what felt like forever until I had an idea. The next stop was right by a convenience store where a friend of mine named James worked. I didn't know if he would be working at the time but it was honestly my only hope. And if that didn't work, I could at least go inside and call the cops and my mom. When the bus stopped, I got off of it and ran to these store as fast as I could. Sure enough, James was working. I checked to see if the guy had followed me to discover that he had and was walking towards the store. I quickly explained to James the fact that I had been followed by a creepy older man, and I didn't know what to do. Now, he wasn't a bodybuilder or anything, but James was a big guy. Not the kind of guy you want to mess with, and he told me that he would take care of it. When the creep entered, James approached him and asked him if he needed anything. The old guy glanced at me and said he didn't need anything but was going to wait outside if that was okay. James told him no, it wasn't, and that if he did, he'd be calling the police. The creep did not appear to like the sounds of that, seeing as he had no chance of ever beating James in a physical confrontation. He left in a hurry. After I was sure that he was gone, I completely broke down and cried for a good long time in that store. James may have saved my life that day, or at least saved me from something horrific. I ended up calling my mom to come get me. She was upset about having to leave work, but when I told her the whole thing, that was basically the end of my online school and my bus days. I finished my semester and got rides from my grandfather and went back to public school the semester after that. I, a European woman, am currently staying in a South American capital. And being a foreigner, I guess I stand out a little, but I didn't feel threatened or in danger at all during the month that I spent there. Until yesterday. I was waiting for the bus alone at around 3 p.m. on a sunny day. No one else was around. And then some guy appeared in the distance. 
I can't really say why, but he looked shady. Probably because he looked like he was walking straight towards me even if the pavement was pretty wide. I pretended that I didn't see him and waited for him to pass by, but he came to me, asking for money, and maybe something else that I didn't understand. I answered very firmly that no, I didn't have anything to give him, and stepped back a little, keeping my head up and trying to show that I was not disturbed. He kept coming closer to me, making me feel very uncomfortable, and started pointing his finger at my face saying, I'll kill you, I'll kill you, repeatedly. That's when I started thinking that I might be in danger, even if this guy didn't have any visible weapon. I had no idea what he was capable of, especially as he was extremely close to me and he was still threatening to kill me. Still trying to calmly walk away from him so as to not show him I was panicking, I looked all around for someone who might help me, but the street was still deserted. And that's when I saw a bus come in. I waved at it and the doors were already open. I climbed in without looking back. The driver's assistant told me to hurry to get in. He had seen the scene from a distance and he told me not to worry, that we just needed to get away from uh, the crazy guy. This all happened in the span of 30 seconds, but a lot could have gone wrong in such a short amount of time. I'm glad I remained relatively calm and I'll probably invest in pepper spray for the future. To paint a picture, I'm a guy who loves having long hair and when this happened, I was not yet able to grow facial hair as well as I do now. So I was clean shaven and pretty much looked like I could be a girl due to some rather feminine features. Maya had just come out of university and gotten on the bus. There was only one place free where nobody else was sitting. So I got to nearly the back of the bus and sat next to the window, just listening to music, minding my own business. Behind me in the back of the bus were two other guys who looked like they might have been either homeless or did a job that made them have rather dirty clothing. I hadn't seen them when I came in because I tend not to look at people all that much. A social anxiety and just wanting to get home early. They seemed to be a bit drunk and that's kind of how the next bit came to be. About nine minutes into the bus ride, I felt a tap on my shoulder snapping me out of my staring out the window routine and it was the guy sitting most towards the middle. I shall shorten him to DG for either dirty guy or drunk guy. Hey there, can you break a tenor? Oh, sorry, I don't have any. Whoa, that's not a voice I expected. Are you a guy or a girl? I was rather annoyed now. I'm a guy and sorry, I can't help you. At this point, I put my headphones back on and went back to looking out the window because this is where any normal, albeit rude, conversation would have ended. He leaned back to his seat and had a conversation with his friend, which was becoming increasingly loud before I felt another tap on my shoulder. I sigh and take off my headphones again. Yeah? So, uh, do you have a wiener? What? Me and my friend just made a bet on whether you do or not. And can you take off your pants? What the heck is wrong with you? At this point, the DG had gotten up while his friend was encouraging him and blocked my way out of my seat. Come on, let us see. I'll share the money with you, all right? Dude, leave me alone. I became aware of the fact that he was a lot taller and stronger than me and of the fact that everyone else on the bus was trying to ignore my situation. He moved closer and put his hand on my chest and rather forcefully said, Show me now. This reflexively caused me to shove him as hard as I could. This, due to his apparently drunken state, made him fall backwards as I quickly pushed past him. The bus had just stopped, so I got out while he was struggling to get to his feet. The bus pulled away and I saw him and his friend shouting and making gestures. I stood there shaking at the bus stop waiting for the next bus for about 10 minutes. When I was a 17 year old senior in high school, I was in my school music department's auditioned women's choir. One day, I rushed home to have dinner with my mom before going back to the school. For context, I got home around 3.30 or 3.45 and had to be back to school by 6. So I would usually take the bus that got me to school around 5.30 so that I would have time to go to the bathroom, grab some water and relax for a few minutes before I walked into a rehearsal with several girls 
who were popular, snooty, and loved to mock me every chance they got. Which is also beside the point, except to say that it put me in a less than perfectly at ease kind of mental state for the night. There was a bus stop diagonally across the intersection from the small three-story apartment building that I would usually wait at to catch a bus to the station, or I would pick up the bus to the school. I had only been standing there for about a minute when this guy looked to be about 45 or 55. I'll call him Dave just to have something to call him, even though I don't know his actual name. I get a bit of a creepy vibe from him from the start, but I try to be polite. Being the naive 17-year-old I was and hoping that I was just being paranoid. Dave takes another step or two closer to me and starts asking me personal questions, like what my name was, my age, and what school I went to. You know, things that someone who's closer to retirement than they are at high school should not be asking or saying to a minor, even one who's 17. He continued to try to talk to me until the bus arrived, while I gave him shorter and shorter responses to his questions, and tried to make it clear that I wasn't interested in continuing the conversation any further. I got on the bus and, to my disappointment, but certainly not a surprise, he followed suit sitting in the front-facing seat directly behind me. The entire way to the bus station, he kept whispering in my ear about how sexy I was, what great eyes I had, etc. I tried to ignore him and put my earbuds in my ears, but he pulled my earbud out of my left ear, the one closer to the window end, most likely, out of the driver's view in the mirror. He leaned closer and got his mouth so close to my ear that I could feel his breath as he spoke. You would look beautiful on my bed. Yeah, that would be a good look for you. This is the only thing he said where I can remember an exact quote. Even now, a decade later, I can still sometimes feel his breath on my ear. I just hope that one day I'll stop feeling that same sketched out, skin is crawling feeling whenever I see anyone who looks even remotely like him. When I was in middle school, I took the city bus to school because my parents couldn't drive me and no school buses routed to my neighborhood. I didn't live in a very good place, but I never felt unsafe, probably because I was a kid and I thought myself invincible. That morning, I got on the bus to go to school, 6th grade at the time, so I was about 12. But let me tell you, I've always looked much younger than my age. It was decently crowded, so I go to my usual spot in the back. A few stops go by, and then a man gets on and sits right next to me. It's been about 10 years now, but I still remember how it looked. Tall, thin, with long, straight black hair. There was maybe one or two seats open, so it wasn't weird that he was next to me at first. I just figured he sat in the first seat that he saw open. But then he started to talk to me. I can't remember what he said at first. But being early in the morning and already peeved that I had to share my space with him, I just made a vague, disinterested noises at him. And then he asked where I was going. And that's when my spidey senses started to tingle. Because obviously it was early morning and I'm a child, so I'm going to school. So I said, school, in a dull way. I realize now he was probably looking for me to tell him which school. A few stops went by and the bus opened up more so I quickly went and found another empty seat. Not five minutes later he follows and sits right next to me again and still tries to get me to talk to him. He asked my name. I look to the front of the bus and see some 8th graders that I know from school and from riding this bus. My animal brain screams at me to find safety in the pack. I move up to the front of the bus and plant myself in the middle of them and basically press myself into them and give them help me eyes. The guy moves again and sits directly in front of me. He asks my name again and one of the boys I'm sitting with, G, quickly calls me by a fake name and turns his body so he's kind of shooting me and carries on a conversation with me until we get to our school. The group of 8th graders basically formed a circle around me and we huddled off the bus and I turned to make sure the creep didn't follow us. Thankfully, he didn't follow. But for the next few weeks, I caught either the earlier or later bus in case he was on it again. And since the bus stop was right in front of my school, I was afraid he knew where I went and would show up. But I never saw him again. Thankfully.
I was on my way back home from a late night session at the gym. The gym is right next to my campus, but my flat was on the complete other side of the city. So I was definitely making sure that I caught one of the last buses. Otherwise, it was a long, long walk back. I got to the bus stop and it was empty. Except for one older guy who looked pretty disheveled and out of it. Already, this was setting off alarm bells in my mind, so I stood far away from him and began to wait. The bus tracker said that the next bus wouldn't be for another 15 minutes. Dang it. No oh well. I put my headphones in and started listening to one of my podcasts to pass the time. All the while making sure I kept the man within my peripheral vision. It should be noted at this point that I have dwarfism. I'm four foot nothing and about 80 pounds, and I'm used to unwanted attention. It was against my better judgment that I was even out this late by myself and an unfamiliar part of town. I must have let my guard slip because I suddenly felt a hand on my shoulder, and the man was standing right next to me. Too close. I looked up at him and he was saying something to me, so I took my headphones out to hear him. You, you all right there, pal? I was saying that I've never seen one of you before. He was swaying and grinning at me. I'm all right, thanks. What bus are you getting? I didn't want to answer that truthfully, but there were only two buses left to come that night. I said it was the other one, and he looked disappointed. I always wanted to meet one of you. He stood there and stared at me for what felt like a whole minute. I felt his eyes all over me. Now I think I understand what people mean when they say they felt like a piece of meat. Eventually, he said, Do you do it? I've had some inappropriate questions from strangers before, but that took the biscuit. I should have said that it was none of his business, but I found myself saying yes uncomfortably. He seemed to contemplate that for a while, amused by the idea. What's it like down there? I've always wanted to know. From his tone, he sounded excited. I took a couple steps away from him. This time, I was more prepared. It's not really your business. I was thinking about how long the walk would be back home. He was getting the bus that I needed. I didn't know where the other bus went. Was it worth going through with a lie? I didn't know. I suspected that he would get on the same bus as me regardless. He took a step closer. This was the moment I actually got scared. He saw me step backwards and didn't care. He knew I was uncomfortable and he didn't care. That means it's big, he laughed. I bet it does. I've always wanted to. That was it. I wish I had said, screw off or leave me alone, or something. But I was too scared. I need to go. I blurted and walked as briskly as I could without running. It would take him no effort at all to catch up to me. I pictured him walking behind me with his much longer legs, but I didn't want to look. I walked for a couple minutes before I finally glanced back. He was still at the bus stop but he had moved about 10 feet to stand at the edge of it. I could only see his silhouette against the light of the bus stop, but I could tell that he was watching me. I turned around a corner street just to get out of sight. I walked the full hour and a half home, picturing him following me the whole way. It creeps me out to this day.